Hi, I'm Avery Davidson. And I'm Kristen Oaks White. Thank you for joining us for This Week in Louisiana Agriculture, the only TV show bringing Louisiana farmers and consumers together every week. Well, fires are all over the news and with good reason. There's a burn ban in effect for the entire state and a red flag warning, which means conditions are prime for wildfires. More than 50 wildfires ignited across the state in a single weekend, according to Commissioner of Agriculture and Forestry Dr. Mike Strain. This week, Twyla's Carl Wiggers takes us to Sabine Parish, site of one of those fires. Waylon Salter is surveying the damage of his fence that stood no chance from the fiery blaze that stormed through these trees into his pasture. However, as Salter explains, this open field is where local and Forest Service firefighters could turn the tide on this wildfire. Whenever the fire is in the timber, in the tops of the trees, it's almost impossible to do anything with it on the ground. You have to fight that from the air. But it, once it gets out in the open like this, that's what they're really trained to do, and they can get ahead of it. Before the fire made it to his pasture, this is the ominous view Salter watched from his driveway on Sunday afternoon. Salter says his first thought was to take care of his cattle. My main focus was getting the cattle out, of course, and I had a plan for that. It turned out to really not be that big of an issue because once the fire got out here in the open, the fire department and the forest service, they, was, they, they got ahead of it really quick. And, and since then, a lot of it has been just hot spots trees that have been on fire and they, they produce embers and that's what some of this is over here from yesterday. Salter says the conditions around his property have been so dry, but he was pleased with the amount of grass that he still had available for his cattle. This fire changed that. Probably 30 or 40 percent of the pasture was still sort of green and palatable to the cattle. The rest of it has turned, you know, kind of golden and brown. It's stockpiled so they'll still graze it, but most of the, the good grazing, it actually got burned in the fire. That's why he was especially thankful to walk out into this field Monday morning to see this hay barn still standing. There's usually, almost always, a way around everything. Sometimes you get to the point to where there just are no options. Now, for instance, if that hay barn had burned with the hay in it, that would have been a wrap. It would have been time to call Superior and get the trailers over here. For now, the cattle are soaking up the shade and recovering from a stressful few days. In Sabine Parish, I'm Carl Wiggers for This Week in Louisiana Agriculture. Within an hour of leaving his farm, smoldering embers reignited a spot in Salter's fields, which is a fear he said he will continue to have until rain comes and conditions around his home improve. And you guys, I mean, seeing this, this drone video, seeing it from above, the danger is so, like, it's so dry. And it's, mm -hmm. hard, to, it's hard to imagine the anxiety, the fear that, that, I mean, I just referenced, but having that possibility, you know, any moment can re reignite a fire. Like, that's terrible. Well, there's Terrifying. pine trees in one of those shots? There's pine trees everywhere. A lot that of are, burned pine but trees. But that are too. brown. Oh, yeah, you can see. I don't know yeah. that I've ever seen like that. Some of this footage, like this right here, is some smoldering, uh, you know, trees that just, you can see straight down through the tops of the, these pine trees that are just burned straight just up. How dry it is. And how close did this get to his hay barn? Uh, I mean, it was 30 feet. I mean, one road area kind of pretty much between one of these barns that actually burned down. And his hay barn, you can see it right there. But what's terrifying, and I don't actually have video right here to show you, but it was about that close to his house. Oh, wow. I mean, there was a strip of, of the pasture that burned all the way down to the road that, that Des Road that we drove in on that mm -hmm. was across the road from his house. What would he have done had it gotten to his hay barn? I mean, he said he was ready to call Superior Livestock and, and bring some trailers and load the cows up. I mean, it was that, wow. it's that serious out there. There's, there's not, the best grass he had is burned. Mm. So it's, it's terrible. Carl Wiggers, thanks for bringing us this tough story because people need to know about it. A perfect storm is building in the cattle business and none of it is bringing any rain to Louisiana producers. Twilight's Neil Malanson takes us to the Feliciana parishes where the three months of drought have many ranchers thinking about their future in the cattle business. The grass shouldn't sound like this. It also shouldn't look like this, but John Thompson's ranch in West Feliciana Parish hasn't gotten rain in weeks. His family has been on this land for generations and John is 66 years old. He says this summer is the worst he's seen. The heat is so bad here, you just can't even do anything in the afternoons. 
uh, Sunday afternoon, it was 107.6 degrees uh, at four o'clock in the afternoon. The high heat is drying up the ponds on his property. The ones that remain can't hold oxygen because of the heat, killing these brim meant for John's grandchildren to fish. The cattle are still alive and hiding out in the woods nearby, but Thompson says they're just not growing. They were sustaining this. Uh, I'm not saying they were gaining any weight. If it was, it was a minimal amount. Uh, most of the time, these calves are gained two pounds a day uh, when they're on feed and good pasture, but uh, the, I don't think they were gaining even a pound a day. Thompson's been helping his neighbor in East Feliciana Parish. Speck Slaughter needed some help with a tank system as this big pond is also empty. He's selling off some calves in a couple of weeks and says he wish it could be sooner due to the cost of keeping them alive. I'm not going to span, probably going to have to sell some cows, you know, cut, cut back. And I, I contract my calves and I, they supposed to go next week after next. I wish it was last week, but I had a date set. So. Slaughter has some green grass that he fertilized, but without rain, it just doesn't take. He only cut half of this field to leave something for the cows. What I've cut, I usually put up about 800 bales, and I got 300. I'm getting a bale today because where I used to get three or four bales. I'm 76, and I've seen it dry before, but not like, not like it is now. Most cattlemen are also grass farmers, but there's just not a lot to make hay. These 200 bales of silage are all Thompson has been able to make, and most of them were made in May. And since May, the pastures just have not come back. We've got some hay to cut, but it's talking with uh, all my uh, friends that are ranchers that uh, the hay production is just not what it ought to be. You're lucky if you get a bale to the acre. It's a tough situation for tough cattlemen, many of whom are at what is normally retirement age. Thompson says he'll keep going because it's in his blood. It's a perfect storm for a disaster in the cow market, and I mean in the cow business. It's too hard to work, you know, for younger folks can go out and just draw a paycheck. If they cut you right here, you bleed dirt and cow. That's the way it is. Normally, I'd be in about two feet of water here on this pond at John Thompson's place. However, this summer's drought has left nothing but this dry, cracked earth and the hope of not just a rain, but many days of it they'll need to get this place growing again. Reporting from West Feliciana Parish, I'm Neil Malonson. Now, right now, the most important thing that you can do is report the severity of the drought to the U.S. Drought Monitor. That will be key for any future relief efforts. You can find a link to that on our website at twilighttv.org. And because this is such an important story, joining us now is Neil Malasson. Neil, wanted to get your perspective on this and how are farmers and ranchers dealing with this mentally? Because this is an extreme stress on top of stress. Yeah, it really is. And I, I think the, you know, one interesting thing I found out at John Thompson's place was the movie The Maze Runner mm -hmm. was shot at his place in 2012. Hmm. And it's just funny because when I think of movies, like if I were to cast a cattleman, John Thompson would be that guy, yeah. you know, tall, deep voice. But also, I, I've known him for 20 years, very friendly guy, you know, ready with a smile, ready with a joke. He's everyone's friend. I don't think he's ever met a stranger. In those 20 years, I've just never seen him this dispirited. Yeah. I was going to say, he must be pretty optimistic, but not this week. Yeah. He's just in, as he said, he's never seen it this bad in all of his lifetime. And he's the chair of the Louisiana Beef Industry Council. Yes. It's not like he's not in a leadership position That's across right. the state. Yeah. For him to show this kind of vulnerability is, is important, I think, for other ranchers to see. It, it really is important. And, and I think that, you know, for everyone in, in, on top of um, reporting to the drought monitor, Call your friends, call your neighbors, call your pastors, your therapist, whomever, and talk to them. Tell them about what's going on. Tell them about what you feel because, I mean, the reason they're staying in business at 66 and 76 and 86 is because they love the stuff. It's mm -hmm. not a job. It's not mm -hmm. a something they do for fun. It's mm -hmm. their livelihood and lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And seeing it go up in flames like in Carl's package or seeing it just wither and die like we see in mine, it's just a hard thing to bear, even for someone like me who doesn't isn't in the agriculture business. And the, there are resources out there. The American Farm Bureau has the Farm State of Mind uh, website. We also have mental health resources mm -hmm. on lafarmbureau.org. So you can go there. We'll put links to go with these stories. 
Yeah, and, and it's really important to you know to reach out there. And if you're not in the cattle business, not in the agriculture business, just appreciate where all of this comes from. Because like you talked about, and it's a perfect storm that's coming. One of which we're all going to feel next year when we try and buy beef prices because we have. Uh, nationally historically low cattle uh, inventory. We have high prices. We have these farmers who are at retirement age, if not older, and we have historically high cattle prices. All of these things are coming together to mean that cattle are just going in, and next year, when there aren't these cattle there to sell, prices are just going to go up. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you very much for that perspective, Neil Malonsaw. Well, irrigation is a necessity for Louisiana crops with this hot and dry weather. That's if you're able to get water. Craig Gotro with the LSU Ag Center shows us why these are trying times for Louisiana agriculture. The weather has been stuck on repeat nearly all summer in Louisiana. Hotter than average temperatures with little relief from rain. For some, irrigation pumps have been running nearly nonstop trying to keep up. When rain does happen to fall, even its full benefits aren't received. They tend to be intense, uh, maybe a larger rainfall event that uh, will run off much quicker and not stay there and infiltrate that soil. In most years, farmers have to irrigate three to five times. Davis Conger said some farmers have irrigated up to eight times and the growing season isn't over yet. If farmers want to make a successful crop, they have no choice but to irrigate. When we're looking at irrigated versus not irrigated, and that's the only difference, um, I've seen about a 75 to 100 percent increase in my yield. Farmers relying on surface water for irrigation are having problems with their supply. Now this year we had a sugarcane project uh, going on in Cheneyville, and we weren't able to even irrigate that this year, even though it was a good irrigation year, because the bayou they're pulling the water from is so low. Regardless of the method or source, farmers are having to spend a great deal of money to keep their crops watered this year. With the LSU Ag Center, this is Craig Gotro reporting. Unfortunately, the long-term forecast offers no relief for Louisiana, nor much of the southeast for that matter. More hot, dry weather ahead with that ridge of high pressure continuing to dominate weather here in Louisiana and much of the country. Well, Louisiana's corn harvest is quickly coming to an end. According to the latest USDA Crop Progress Report, corn harvest is way ahead of schedule. That report says 68 percent of corn has been harvested in Louisiana, and that number is climbing fast with the hot, dry weather across the state. Compare that number to the five-year average of 54 percent, and you can see why farmers are way ahead. In Franklin Parish, many farmers were impacted by the tough freeze in late March. Now is the time farmers like Scott Wiggers are seeing just how bad that freeze was for their crops. After the freeze, we replanted two or three hundred acres of corn and we kept some corn, thinking that it would uh, survive and we'd have a good enough stand to have a good yield. This field is not one of those that uh, turned out very well. It has some, uh, has some skips, if you, if you can see out in the field, sometimes they're maybe six inches skip, we'll miss, miss a plant, sometimes we had two or three feet skipped. and so. Uh, this field has a lot of skips in it, and the, the yield is going to definitely be impacted by that. Now, soybean harvest is next for Wiggers and many others with corn acres in northeast Louisiana. I'm sure this hot, dry weather is helping speed that crop along. Well, it's not just drought and hot weather damaging crops. Feral hogs cause more than $91 million in damage to agriculture each year. Funding to eradicate feral hogs is tied to the Farm Bill and would not continue if Congress only passes an extension. Farmers in northwest Louisiana say it is vital for that funding to continue. It's approaching the witching hour, and Chris Long and Dale McPherson are approaching a $91 million a year problem in a freshly harvested cornfield. There's two pigs. Feral hogs. Long can see them clearly through his thermal scope. He sets his rifle on a tripod, takes aim, and... He gets the first one, but the other starts running down the woods line toward him. Two shots, two kills. What Long and McPherson are doing is not for fun or sport. They're doing it to keep hogs from destroying crops like they often do on Christian Frierson's farm in DeSoto Parish. They will go in and they will wipe out acres upon acres of cornfields that really will start becoming like farmers just with pigs alone are losing percentage of their crop. So that's, I mean, it's a big deal. It's a huge deal. Huge problem. Frierson says this field in particular is a favorite of feral hogs. He sees the damage in lower yields at harvest. Part of the reason the hogs like this area is because there are woods nearby. 
why the pigs are so heavily populated in Louisiana and hard to control is all the cover. When the corn gets big, that's just another form of cover. They'll live in it. If they've got a water source close by, they are not coming out of it. And we really can't, you know, we can't control them that way. Back on the hunt, Long and McPherson spot something. He got about a 200 pound boar hog out there by himself, just in some cut corn. Wind's just right, we're gonna try to sneak up on the sucker. This time they line up to take it out. From that, those two pigs to this pig as the crow flies, is probably 350 yards, 400 yards. And they never, he never knew we were here. Hunting traps and now a patented bait from LSU are all tools used to control feral hogs. But if Congress does not approve a new farm bill, the funding used to help control them could be shot. If you let your guard down one night, they're going to come in and that's when they're going to do their damage. So we're going until we get a stand. If not, the corn's two, three, four inches tall to where they really start, stop touching it. I mean, that's long nights and we're covering lots of acres. I mean, you're staying out way past midnight, one, two, three in the morning. And uh, yeah, it'll wear on you during that time. But hey, that's the only way we can control them. I mean, we, just, we have to do it. The state of Louisiana recently reinstated its feral hog task force, which includes members from Louisiana Farm Bureau and the Department of Agriculture and Forestry. Still to come on Twyla, honoring two Farm Bureau leaders who led the organization for more than half of its 101 year existence. But first, we meet another candidate running for Secretary of State. My interview with Brandon Trosclair is next. Stay with us. Thanks for staying with us here on This Week in Louisiana Agriculture. We're going to continue meeting the candidates who are running for statewide elected office on October 14th. Joining us now is Brandon Trosclair. He is running for Secretary of State. Brandon, thank you so much for joining us here on Twyla. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Well, let's learn a little bit about you. You actually have a few direct connections to not just agriculture, but to our consumers as well. Yeah, so I'm in the grocery business. I have 13 grocery stores all across uh, South Louisiana uh, and into Mississippi. I've been in the grocery business uh, for the most part my entire life. Since the, the day after I turned 15, I started mopping those floors in Rouse Market. And uh, you know we started off with one little local fresh, uh, fresh market, and now we have 13 stores. So, yes, sir. And you also have uh, some cows, some chickens of your own. Tell me a little bit about that. And we were just talking a little while ago about the Jersey cow you milk. Right, right. So we, we do have a Jersey cow that we milk back home. Uh, probably have 20, 25 chickens, uh, different count, it seems like every time we're counting. But, uh, and then we also have uh, horses that we breed and raise thoroughbreds and quarter horses. Uh, we do that here and in Arkansas as well. Uh, so we're, we're heavily involved with, uh, with the equine industry as well. So home is where? Uh, Gonzales, Louisiana. Uh, I have 16 acres out in the country in Gonzales, and uh, I, I'm a good old country boy at heart. Uh, grew up on family property, probably uh, two miles as the crow flies from where I'm at now, and just always been outdoors, always been involved with, with horses and cows and chickens, and my dad had pigs at one time. Um, and then, uh, so we've always been outdoor country folks. Uh, and of course, my dad's also always been in the grocery business. He started for, with Winn-Dixie way back in the early 70s when he got out of high school. And then it's, uh, it's just, it's in our blood, I guess. So now you're going from the grocery business. I'm sure you'll still have that going, but sure. you're wanting to run for Secretary of State. What made you decide to run for this office? Yeah, so I'm a guy, uh, Avery, that's always had the attitude uh, that I'm not going to sit on the sidelines. Uh, I love our country. I think this is the greatest country uh, on the face of the planet, and I love my state. And I wasn't going to be the guy that would whine and complain about things and problems that we had at the state and lo uh, local level without doing something about it and getting involved. And so uh, I was the guy that was responsible for standing up to Joe Biden's uh, massive government overreach with the vaccine mandate. And so when they announced the vaccine mandate, which would have said that your employers, employees have to take the vaccine no matter what, or, or I had to fire them, um, I thought that was, again, a massive government overreach. Fought ourselves all the way to the United States Supreme Court, won that battle, uh, and it's estimated that I saved over 80 million jobs across the country. Uh, and it was an honor of a lifetime to stand up for my business, but more so the American worker and my employees. And uh, when I finished that, um, started working on election integrity here in Louisiana, working with our state department and with a large group of people uh, here across the state, and uh, had a lot of vulnerabilities in our elections and a lot of problems. 
and ultimately at the end, uh, our State Department didn't do anything about it. And really, no one with political authority in Louisiana is doing anything about election integrity. So I said, I'm, if nobody else will do it, I'll, I'll do it myself. So that's why I decided to run for Secretary of State. What do you see as the issues with the elections, and what do you propose to, to fix those issues? Yeah, so the, the biggest thing that we have right now is we're the only state in the country, uh, the only state in the country, according to Louisiana Legislative Audit Report, that we can't audit our elections. That's huge. Uh, and that's been sent out to all of our state representatives and senators. One of my opponents, it's addressed to him. And they're, they, again, we're the only state in the country you can't audit our elections. That's a huge problem. Uh, number two is that we have outdated technology voting machines that are vulnerable to being hacked and manipulated. Um, we have tons of proof on that, uh, but just uh, there's a Haldeman report came out about a month ago saying the, the new machines, not even talking about the old machines, but the new machines that we have for early voting, which is 42% of our vote, that that very machine can be hacked and manipulated in over 15 different ways and our authorities wouldn't even know that, that it was being manipulated. So we're going to replace that with a hand-marked secure paper ballot. We had the Louisiana Voting Commission have hearings in the Senate two years ago, and every single expert that testified said hand-marked secure paper ballots was the safest and most secure way to have an election. So that's what we're going to replace it with. And another big problem that we have here is that we have an F in the accuracy of our voter rolls according to the Heritage Foundation. So in our analysis that we have over 700,000 people in Louisiana, which is one in five Louisianians, that are either inactive and ineligible and should be removed from the voter rolls according to the law. So you got extremely dirty voter rolls, you got vulnerable voting machines, we're gonna clean that all up and we're gonna give safe and secure elections that the people of Louisiana deserve. So if uh, you were talking to voters like you do all the time going door to door, what would you tell them? What's your message on why they should vote for you, Brandon? Yeah, because I'm, I'm a regular guy. I, I'm not in this. I don't need a job. Uh, and I'm not a politician. I'm doing this for, for the people. I want to restore customer service. I tell people all the time that we're in the customer service business and we happen to sell groceries. I think it's time that we government at every level starts focusing back on the customer, which is the citizens of Louisiana. And we're beholden to only one group of people, and it's not lobbyists or anything like that. It's the people of Louisiana. They need a business guy that, that has courage and backbone, like I proved when I went to the Supreme Court. And we're going to uh, replace these uh, faulty machines with paper ballots. Uh, first time ever you'll be able to audit your elections. We're going to clean up our registration rolls and we're going to keep them clean. And again, we're going to give you a safe and secure election. Again, like, like the people deserve and they haven't had in a very long time. And so I'm, I'm your guy for that. And, and the only candidate that, uh, that is even acknowledging the problems that we have. Uh, there's four other candidates in this race, and I'm the only candidate that acknowledges that we even have a problem. Avery, the others, they say everything's fine and hunky-dory, and it's really it's not. Well, we're glad that you took time to come here. He is Brandon Trosclair running for Secretary of State. Brandon, thank you so much for joining Thanks us. Thanks for having me, Dave. Appreciate it. Well, coming up on Twyla, we have a Twyla boost to help you brighten your day. Stay with us. Well, now it's time for the Twyla Boost. And if you're part of the Louisiana Farm Bureau family, we know that this boost will bring a big smile to your face. In appreciation of the 57 years Mr. Jimmy Gronyard and Mr. Ronnie Anderson collectively served as president of the Louisiana Farm Bureau, two rooms in the new state office were named in their honor. Whatever we had to do, he always put the, the, the company and the, and the, and the members and the, and the policy holders first. And I, I think that's why Farm Bureau has been successful. Ronnie and Mr. Gronyard and, and the other leadership have been very diligent and supported and, and made really good decisions for the organization and for the membership. And so if uh, there's success in the organization, certainly the two of them get to claim uh, quite a, a measure of credit for that. Ronnie has demonstrated the, the leadership capabilities that were recognized here in Louisiana at the multi-state companies in Washington with the American Farm Bureau as a member of the executive committee, and really across the nation. Being able to work with other farmers and uh, leadership in, uh, from other farm bureaus uh, to be able to, to accomplish the goals that we had set out, that they had set out. President Jim Harper and the board have uh, agreed and have decided to name the boardroom, the Anderson Boardroom.
Yeah, definitely can't think of two more deserving people. And I know Mr. Jim Harper, current president of the Farm Bureau, is happy that he could be there too. Hey, excellent honor for both of those men. Well, that does it for this edition of Twyla. Be sure to join us next week when we'll meet two more candidates for statewide office, one of whom is now going in unopposed. Until then, you can watch all of our stories online at twylatv.org and be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram. You can find these stories and more on our YouTube channel. So be sure to subscribe, turn on those notifications. That way you get a little ding whenever we put out some new content. For all of us here at Twyla, thanks for joining us. We hope to see you again right here next week.